Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our lecture tonight by Anne Applebaum, the um, new Philippe Roman Chair in History and International Affairs in LSE Ideas. I'm Arne Westard, the Director of LSE Ideas, and it is a great pleasure for me to welcome Anne back, I must say, to LSE as the Philippe Roman Professor. It's wonderful to have you here. I think the lecture tonight will be quite a feast, and we're much looking forward to it. Uh, just before introducing Anne a little bit further, a few people I want to thank um, who have helped set up the uh, Philippe Roman chair here and help us run it. Uh, the staff in LSE Ideas who always work very hard to create these public events, to set them on, to set everything up for them. We are very, very lucky in Ideas. We have a fantastic staff. Ideas is quite a unique institution at LSE. Not only is it interdisciplinary in terms of its approach, blending historical approaches with social sciences approaches uh, in the study of international affairs, but I must say that our strength, first and foremost, is all of the young people who join ideas during term time, who come from various backgrounds, both undergraduates and, and postgraduate students, and now quite a few postdoctoral um, visitors who are, who are with us. They are the core of the center, and it's them really who make all of this possible in terms of the intellectual engagement that we have in ideas. I also want to thank uh, Sir Howard Davis, the former director of LSE, who was crucial in setting up the Philippe Roman chair here and a great supporter of, of LSE ideas in its initial phase. But first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Emmanuel Roman, uh, who is here tonight. It's Emmanuel's generosity that makes this chair possible. Uh, but he's not only someone who provides the funding that is necessary for the chair and quite a few other activities in LSE ideas as well. Emmanuel is a true enthusiast for what we do, and particularly for the stu study of history. He reads far more history than what I do, I find out when we meet from time to time, besides running the global economy and a few, few other things. And how he gets time for all this, I, I don't know. But we are very grateful to you, Emmanuel, for setting up uh, this chair at LSE and being such a great supporter of what we do. And it is the generosity of uh, Emmanuel, the support of the LSE community, that makes it possible tonight for us to welcome Anne Applebaum as the new Philippe Roman Professor in History and International Affairs here. Anne is, among many other things, a columnist for the Washington Post. She is also Director of Political Studies uh, at the Legatum Institute here in London. She has been writing for a number of esteemed publications uh, in different parts of the world. She's written for The Spectator, for The Telegraph, uh, not least for The Economist, where she covered much of the changes in, in, in Eastern Europe uh, for them back in the 80s and, and early 1990s. Her first book, Between East and West, Across the Borderlands of Europe, described a journey through parts of Eastern Europe just when this period of change sets in. It's just when Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus are on the verge of independence. And for those of you who haven't read it, this is much more than a travelogue. This is one of the best books ever written on the changes in Eastern Europe in terms of getting an understanding of how much of the transformation that came from below how much of it that wasn't just about political changes at the top level. And second book, Gulag, a history, a history of the Soviet penal system, was published in 2003 and won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2004. And her new book, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, was published this year. You'll find it later on for sale outside if you want to pick up a copy and it's already been nominated for one of the most prestigious literary awards in the world, the U.S. National Book Award uh, for this year. Now, Anne is not just a very accomplished author, uh, journalist, and historian. She also had, as I indicated earlier on, uh, links to LSE that predates her present invitation. She was here uh, doing her master's degree at the school. So it is a very great honor and pleasure for me, and to welcome you back to LSE. We're very much looking forward to your inaugural lecture today on True Believers, Collaboration and Opposition Under Totalitarian Regimes. We're looking forward to your stay in LSE Ideas and to the lectures to come. There will be three more lectures in this series later on in the year. Please let us all give an LSE welcome back to Anna Applebaum. Uh, 
thank you, Arnie, for that extremely generous introduction. I'm particularly touched that you remember my first book, which has been out of print as far as I know for about 15 years. Um, it's very nice that the, the past... Get it reprinted. Get it reprinted, yes. Um, is my publisher here? <laughs> um, also, thank you very much indeed to Emmanuel Roman, who I had the um, good fortune to meet accidentally at lunch um, a, a, about a year ago and only at, and at that time had already um, been asked if I wanted to do this job and I've, I've uh, had the good fortune of being friends with him ever since. Um, I am indeed delighted to be back at LSE. Uh, it's interesting, I was a master's, I did a master's degree here and at the time didn't appreciate it. That's all I'll say for now. I, I, didn't, I didn't see the value of it, and actually many years later I did, uh, the things that I learned here. So study hard. Um, and now, as was traditional once at public meetings, which took place several hundred miles to the east of this room, I'd like to begin this lecture with a song. Um, don't worry, I won't actually sing it. Um, but even when read aloud and even in English, I think the spirit of the song provides a good introduction to the subject of my talk this evening, which also happens to be the, one of the central subjects of my new book, Iron Curtain, uh, namely the nature of collaboration in post-war Stalinist Central Europe. Uh, the title of the song is The Song of the Party. It was the anthem of the East German Communist Party, and the lyr lyrics go like this. She gave us everything, sun and wind, always generous, Wherever she was, there was life. We are what we are because of her. She never abandoned us. Even in a frozen world, we were warmed. And now the refrain. The party, the party, she is always right. And comrades, so it will remain. Since he who fights for the right is always right, he who defends mankind is always right. As raised to life by Lenin's spirit, as welded by Stalin, the party, the party, the party, and in German it's die Partei, die Partei, die Partei. Now, to our modern, or should I say postmodern ears, those words are not exactly emotive. Now, on the contrary, they seem absurd, uh, much in the way that old films of Hitler can seem absurd. If you poke around on the internet, you can now find Mickey Mouse singing that song in someone's homemade Vizio, as well as spiky-haired teenagers pretending to dance to it. Uh, without an intact ideology to support them, the art forms of Soviet-style totalitarianism are not merely outdated, they're laughable. And it's hard to imagine how anyone could have sung them with a straight face. Nevertheless, if one had been standing in that room just like this one, a few hundred miles to the east, round about 1950, everyone around you would have been singing. Some, let me stress, uh, would have done so because they truly believed in the words of the song uh, and because they really did think the party was always right or they hoped it would be. Uh, in this period, uh, just after the devastation of World War II, a cataclysmic crisis which caused many in both Eastern and Western Europe to doubt everything they'd been taught and to believe all of society really did have to be reorganized, Communism seemed to some people like the only viable alternative to the democratic capitalism which had failed so spectacularly in the 1930s. The world had been shattered. Communism seemed to some a better way to rebuild it. Many others, though, were singing because they were, for the lack of a better word, reluctant collaborators. Now, these were the people who did not necessarily believe the slogans they read in the newspapers, but neither did they feel compelled to denounce those who were writing them. They did not necessarily believe that Stalin was an infallible leader, but nor did they tear down his portraits. They didn't necessarily believe that the party, the party, the party is always right, but nor did they stop singing the song. Uh, in, in fact, the horrifying genius of Soviet communism, uh, as conceived in the 1920s, as perfected in the 1930s, as imposed experimentally on the Baltic states and eastern Poland in 1939, and then as spread by force across uh, the rest of Eastern Europe after 1945, was the system's ability to get so many skeptical people in so many different kinds of countries and so many disparate cultures to play along for so many years without relatively that much open protest. At least for a few decades, Soviet-style communism ruled primitive Albania and industrial Bohemia, 
Uh, communists ran East Germany, where the populace had experienced a horrific wave of rape and looting during the Red Army's invasion at the end of the war, and not to mention a decade's worth of anti-Soviet propaganda before that. Uh, communists ran even Poland, which had fought and won a bloody war against the Soviet Union in 1920. Why was the system so successful, or sh why did it last so long? Uh, why, at least briefly, did it even appear to flourish, and how did it spread to so many countries? Um, I won't tell you the whole story, and for that you have to read my book or else listen to me talk all night, um, but I will give you a few elements. Uh, the Red Army and the Soviet secret police, which unexpectedly found themselves occupying Central Europe in 1945, were, to be blunt, very well prepared to take charge. They'd already practiced the techniques of totalitarian takeover in their own Central Asian republics in the 1920s, and, as I said, in Eastern Poland and the Baltic states, which they had invaded in 1939. Even before they got to Warsaw and Berlin, they had trained cadres and secret agents scattered across the region working within and around the communist parties. They also had a plan, though I should be careful about using that word. Uh, from archival documents, we know that Stalin um, had, had, had no doubt that sooner or later all of Europe would be run by communist parties. But he wasn't certain of how long that was going to take. Um, a wartime memo written by his foreign minister during the war uh, spoke of decades. And so in 1945, he proceeded with caution. Instead of attempting a full-blooded takeover, Soviet officials in the region aimed to control just a few key institutions, the ones that they thought were important. Uh, one of these was the radio. Everywhere the Red Army went, its soldiers immediately occupied radio stations, sometimes on day one. The first Soviet broadcast from Berlin went out in German on May 13, 1945, less than two weeks after the Nazi radio's final broadcast, which was the announcement of Hitler's death. In those early days, the NKVD cared about radio far more than it cared about newspapers and magazines because they reckoned radio was the medium that could reach the masses. Uh, the peasants and the workers whose support they expected to receive in due course. Um, above all, Soviet officials believed in the efficacy of their own propaganda. Another tool that Soviet officials in the region deployed very early on, again, long before they attempted to control politics or political parties, uh, was the secret police. Uh, the training of what would become the Polish Security Department, the Urzon Bezpieczeństwa UB, also known as UBEX, uh, began as early as 1940 at a special school near Smolensk. Uh, in Germany, the Stasi were tutored from the very earliest days also by the NKVD, and later they enjoyed an especially close relationship with the KGB, whose symbols they adopted and whose techniques they copied. Uh, these secret policemen had a strange extra legal status in the territories where the Red Army was in place, all of the territories. And so even before, again, the region's governments were dominated by communist parties, the police had power because they were backed by Soviet reinforcements, as everyone well knew. The, the third important point is that these first secret policemen used terror, but they did so in a way far more sophisticated than we sometimes now imagine. So central to the success of the Soviet Union in spreading its system, and incidentally uh, central to the success of so many of the regimes in the Arab world, Africa, and Asia, which later imitated it, was the USSR's careful use not of mass violence, which Soviet secret policemen deliberately avoided after 1945, but of selected violence targeted very specifically at elites, intellectuals, businessmen, priests, ex-politicians, and above all, at anyone capable of leading or organizing any kind of spontaneous organization. Ultimately, they were determined to control not only the government, not only the police, the media, and the economy, but also all of the elements of what we now call civil society. And so very early on, long before they fully nationalized industry, for example, the Soviet occupiers of Eastern Europe harassed and disbanded youth groups. Uh, they forbade the independent or creation of independent sporting organizations. Uh, they treated anyone who worked for a religious or even a secular charity with intense suspicion. In Hungary in 1946, the interior minister banned, among more than a thousand other groups, the Hungarian Athletic Club, the Count Shechini Association of War Veterans, and the Association of Christian Democratic Tobacco Workers. Now, in Poland in 1949, members of the Young Communist Movement stormed into the Polish YMCA and smashed all of the jazz records. In East Germany, in the first months after the war, the occupying 
Soviet powers spent a good deal of time trying to determine which kinds of organizations would and would not be tolerated. Uh, I note for the record that they were very adamant that hiking clubs be banned at all costs. These efforts were, of course, supplemented by economic policies, the redistribution of land, the nationalization of heavy industry, and over time, creeping state control of retail and small business. But just because they were Marxists, and just because their rhetoric therefore made it sound as if they believed the economy mattered above all, that doesn't mean they always behaved as if the economy mattered above all. Uh, on the contrary, they were interested in extending control over all aspects of society. And for that reason, I believe the nations of Eastern Europe were at that time correctly described as totalitarian, a word now used more controversially and originally coined for the benefit of Mussolini, uh, who also gave the best definition of it in one of his speeches. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Though, as, as, as you all know, they did not always succeed. It was certainly the Soviet and East European Communist Party's intention to create totalitarian regimes, which kept everything within the state. And towards the pursuit of that goal, as I say, by about 1948, the communist regimes of the region controlled not only the economy, not only property, not only the political sphere, but also sports, leisure time, hospitals, universities, summer camps, children's after-school activities, art, music, and museums. That ambition to achieve total control wound up putting people in ethical and moral binds, which we can hardly imagine today. Let me give you an example of how that worked. Uh, in 1947, the Soviet military administrators in East Germany passed a regulation governing the activity of publishing houses and printers. So this decree did not nationalize the printing presses. It merely decreed that they had to be licensed, and it also stated that all licensed printing presses were required to print only books and pamphlets ordered by the central planners. Failure to comply with these simple guidelines did not necessarily lead to your murder or your arrest, but it could cause your printing press to be shut down. So now, imagine you are the owner of a printing press in Dresden, and you are presented with such a law. You have a wife who is ill. You have two teenage children. Your cousin was arrested last year and has disappeared. Uh, you've lost your family home during the firebombing of Dresden, and you are living in a small, state-owned apartment. How likely is it that you will defy the law and agree, to print, uh, and agree to print pamphlets which have not been officially ordered by the central planners? You know that you will not be killed for doing so, but you also know you will lose your printer's license and therefore your livelihood. Your children might not get into university. Your wife might not get her medicine. It just isn't worth it. And once you've made that compromise, others follow. Though you dislike communist ideology, when you are presented with the collective works of Stalin, you agree to print those too. Why not? If you don't, others will. Though you don't much like the new government policy on the confiscation of land, it doesn't affect you personally, and you don't really object to printing pamphlets about that either. Meanwhile, all across East Germany, other owners of other printing presses are making the same decisions. And after a while, with nobody being shot and nobody going to prison, and no one even suffering any particular pangs of conscience, the only books left to read are the ones of which the communist regime approves. The same applies to your free time. If you are the owner of that printing press, would you risk your job, your children's schooling, and your wife's access to health care simply in order to play chess in an independent club? Of course not. On the other hand, would you consider yourself a deeply implicated collaborator just because you play chess at the Free German Youth's official chess club? No, of course not. Again, the result of that behavior was the total disappearance of all unofficial, non-state-sponsored organizations from East European societies for a period of time. Who then was singing Departai, Departai, Departai? It was people who wanted to get on with their lives, rebuild their countries, educate their children, feed their families, and stay far away from those in power, but who nevertheless lived in a system which demanded not only that all of those things be done through state institutions, but that you constantly vocalize your approval of them. Even those who were in utterly apolitical jobs often found it impossible not to collaborate. 
uh, Andrzej Panufnik, a Polish composer who eventually wound up living here, uh, had no love for communism, which is a system he found, I, I quote, artistically and morally dishonest. After the war, he wanted nothing except to rebuild his country and compose music. But in order to be allowed to do so, he had to join the Union of Polish Composers. And when all union members were ordered to compete to compose a new song of the party, United Party, that was the Polish version, he was forced to do that too. And he was told that if he refused, he would lose his post as chairman of the Union of Polish Composers, and also the entire union would lose the financial support of the state. So he wrote a song. He said later, and I quote, literally in a few minutes, this is him describing how he wrote the song, setting the ridiculous text to the first jumble of notes which came into my head. It was rubbish, and I smiled to myself as I sent it off to the educators. To his eternal embarrassment, he won first prize. <laughs> now, the USSR's intention was clear eliminate not only opposition, but also the potential for opposition. Destroy not only dissent, but even the possibility of future dissent. Um, there, the obsession, the communist obsession with youth groups and youth movements is a reflection of that. You know, these old people with their, they still go to church, they still believe in old things, they don't matter so much. What we, what we need to do is get the young people and we will convert them to our cause. But let me remind those who are here too young to remember that round about the year 1950, it looked very much as if the communist parties of Eastern Europe would succeed. Uh, the public sphere had been cleansed so thoroughly that a tourist visiting Warsaw, Budapest, East Berlin, Prague, Sofia, Bucharest in the early 1950s would have observed no political opposition whatsoever. The press contained regime propaganda. Holidays were celebrated with regime parades. Conversations did not deviate from the official line if an outsider were present. All serious outside analysts believed this system would last forever. And in this sense, the West was also taken in by Soviet ideology. We also believed it was possible to create a totalitarian society. Uh, Hannah Arendt wrote of totalitarian personalities, um, a, a, a society into which no outside information would ever or could ever penetrate. And we believed that the Soviet Union and the East European communists had done it. Um, you all know the end of the story now, so I won't pretend otherwise. Uh, as it turned out, uh, the experience of living in a society which forced everyone to agree with everything dictated by the central government had profound psychological consequences. Despite all of the state's efforts, despite the extensive education and propaganda, many people retained an inner sense of disjunction or discomfort. Even the people who were the most active collaborators sometimes felt this. A Jacek Czernadl, who was a Polish writer and a youth activist in this period, remembers it like this. He wrote, I was shouting from a tribune at some university meeting in Wrocław and simultaneously felt panicked at the thought of myself shouting. I told myself I was trying to convince the crowd by shouting, but in reality, I was trying to convince myself. If the genius of Soviet totalitarianism was its ability to get people to go along without apparent protests, this was its first fatal flaw. The need to conform to a mendacious political reality left many people haunted by the sense that they were leading double lives. Uh, a celebrated Hungarian psychoanalyst, Lili Haidu Gimes, was perhaps the first to diagnose this as a problem in patients, as well as in herself. I play the game which is offered by the regime, she told friends, though as soon as you accept that rule, you are in a trap. Uh, at the time of the Arab Spring, Frank Fukuyama wrote a brilliant short article about the role which dignity and the deprivation of dignity, dignity played in convincing people in that circumstance to protest. The communist regime has made the same mistake. By forcing people to collaborate uh, and to voice their collaboration and their approval of collaboration, they made them ashamed, resentful, and eventually rebellious. The second fatal flaw lay in the totalitarian nature of the communist project itself. By trying to control every aspect of society, the regimes eventually turned every aspect of society into a potential source of dissent. The state had dictated high daily quota for the workers, quotas for the workers. And so an East German workers' strike against high quotas in 1953 mushroomed very quickly into a protest against the state. 
the state had dictated what artists could paint or writers could write. And so an artist or a writer who painted or wrote something different automatically became a political dissident. The state had dictated that no one could form independent organizations, and so anybody who founded one, however anodyne, became an opponent of the regime. And when large numbers of people joined an independent organization, for example, when 10 million Poles joined the Solidarity Trade Union in 1981, the regime's very existence was suddenly at stake. Uh, communist ideology and Marxist-Leninist economic theory contained the seeds of their own destruction in a different sense, too. Uh, East European governments' claims to legitimacy were based on promises of future prosperity and high living standards, which were supposedly guaranteed by scientific Marxism. All of the banners and posters, the solemn speeches, the newspaper editorials, and eventually the television programs spoke of ever faster growth. But although there was some growth, uh, it was never as high as the propaganda made it out to be. Living standards never rose as quickly and dramatically as they did in Western Europe either, a fact which could not long be hidden. In 1950, Poland and Spain had very similar GDPs. Uh, by 1988, Poland's had risen about two and a half times, but Spain's had risen 13 times. Radio for Europe, travel, and tourism all brought home this disparity, which only grew larger as technological change in Western Europe accelerated. In the end, the gap between reality and ideology meant that the communist parties wound up spouting meaningless slogans which they themselves knew made no sense, made, made no sense. And Marxism became cocooned in what Orwell once called newspeak, so much so that it could not be refuted. Um, my friend, the philosopher Roger Scruton, puts it like this. Facts no longer made contact with the theory which had risen above the facts on clouds of nonsense, rather like a theological system. The point was not to believe the theory, but to repeat it ritualistically, and in such a way that both belief and doubt became irrelevant. In this way, the concept of truth disappeared from the intellectual landscape and was replaced by that of power. Once people were unable to distinguish truth from ideological fiction, however, then they were also unable to solve or even describe the worsening social and economic problems of the societies they ruled. Um, over time, some political opponents of the communist regimes came to understand these inherent weaknesses of the system. Uh, in his brilliant 1978 essay, some of you will know it, The Power of the Powerless, uh, the Czech dissident Václav Havel called upon his countrymen to take advantage of their ruler's obsession with total control. If the state wanted to monopolize every sphere of human activity, he wrote, then every thinking citizen should work to preserve the independent life of society, which he defined as including everything from self-education and thinking about the world through free creative activity and its communications to others to the most varied civic attitudes, including instances of independent social self-organization. He also urged them to discard false and meaningless jargon and to, quote, live in truth, to speak and act, in other words, as if the regime did not exist. Uh, in due course, some version of this independent life of society, civil society we now call it, uh, began to flourish in many unusual ways. The Czechs formed jazz bands, the Hungarians joined academic discussion clubs, uh, the East Germans created an unofficial peace movement, uh, the Poles organized underground scouting troops and eventually independent trade unions. Uh, everyone, everywhere, everybody played rock music, they organized poetry readings, they set up clandestine businesses, they held underground philosophy seminars, they sold black market meat, and they went to church. They also told jokes, uh, which were often very subversive indeed. In a different kind of society, these activities would have been considered apolitical, and even in Eastern Europe, they did not necessarily constitute opposition as such. But they gave people what they felt were spheres of freedom. They allowed them to control some aspects of their own lives, and they gave them back some of the dignity which the totalitarian regimes had taken away. Um, I have a lot more I can say about this topic, about how it's related to the modern world, to contemporary arguments about democracy and democratization, and to the many forms of authoritarianism and totalitarianism which remain. But I was asked not to speak too long, and so I think it's better to stop now and take your comments and questions. Many thanks.